Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to this month's Wellington Trust Heritage Lecture. We're delighted to have you on board again for this and uh, we welcome all 103 of you. So far, so very good. Uh, before we start the lecture, I will just briefly give our usual uh, housekeeping notes, if I may. Uh, during the lecture, if you would like to leave a question, at the bottom of your screens, you should see the Q&A icon tab. Uh, and if you click on that, you will be able to type in your question. At the end of the lecture, Jenny Mosley, my co-trustee, uh, will be collecting the questions and we'll be reading them back to our guest speaker tonight. And uh, we follow on from there. Uh, there is a button there that says chat. Please don't use the chat button for leaving your question. It's just the Q&A button. Uh, the uh, lecture will proceed and at the end of it and after the Q&A, at the end of the formal proceedings, uh, we do actually switch to those who wish to stay over what I call the wash up after the lecture, which is always incredibly interesting, enjoyable, and I think um, entertaining as well. So if you'd like to stay around afterwards, just stay on screen and our absolute uh, guru of an IT man, Matt Edgar, will bring you in. It might take a little while, but don't panic. Uh, you will be brought in if you're still there remaining on screen. And my final note is that there will be the usual recording of this lecture available, and that will be sent to you automatically because you've registered uh, the link to that recording, and that will be sent probably by the end of this week. Now, it is my great pleasure to welcome this month one of our AIM folk, Captain Simon Quayle, who is not only a master mariner, uh, uh, but also a recently appointed ambassador to our trust, the Wellington Trust. And Simon is most welcome. Simon joined the Merchant Navy in 1966. Uh, he was serving as a deck apprentice with the Elder Dempster Lines. Uh, he has worked in a number of trades and, as he says, crossed many oceans. Latterly, as a chief officer with Stevenson Clark Shipping, uh, before leaving sea in 1988, resuming a career in education and retiring as a deputy headmaster in 2009. As I say, as well as being a liveryman of the Honourable Company Master Mariners, he is a, a recently appointed ambassador. But more than that, he has served on the Wellington Trust Education Committee for 11 years, devoted service, developing and helping to develop the Wellington Trust's schools program that has been an incredibly invaluable exercise and we are also grateful to you Simon for that. Simon's latest uh, wheeze is that he is delivering the wheelhouse augmented reality computer simulation which is excellent when you're on board do try and see if you can get involved in that uh, and this is mainly for school children and visitors and once we open the exhibition which will be uh, in, uh, in Easter uh, there will be the opportunity to come on board and see that for yourselves. And he is also a long-term headquartership Wellington tour guide. It's my great pleasure to hand over now to you, Simon, for your lecture. Thank you. Good evening to you all and welcome. In this lecture, I will be talking about my encounters with those amazing sentinels against the storm, the lighthouses of Northern Scotland. I know these lights from a double perspective, from the sea and from the land. I speak as a navigator, not as an engineer. Uh, there are others far better qualified than I to take on that task. And now. When I last went to sea, it was to take the Queen Mary across to New York. It was a birthday present and I enjoyed it enormously. And wandering around, I noticed that I could go and uh, view the bridge, but only through a window. One wasn't allowed on the actual bridge anymore. So there I was three years ago, observing the officer on watch, chatting, checking their positions, 
with instant position readouts, latitude and longitude by GBS. And of course, linked to that mystery that is an, an electronic chart. They had no need when approaching landfall, as I did when I was a navigator, to compare the characteristics of a flashing light on the paper chart with a distant beating loom of light. For me, and for all those who went to sea over 40 years ago, the lighthouse was the vital confirmation of landfall. The lighthouse, and the hope it would be there, as predicted, was my entire focus. And that's why I've always been fascinated by those tall towers guarding against disaster in isolated rocky locations on high cliffs, warning us mariners of the dangers ahead. Now, we're supposed to have moved on to the next slide, so let's see why it won't. There we go. But who built these lights around Scotland's coasts? Who were the founding fathers of this pioneering enterprise? Who was the man who felt such a powerful concern for the welfare of sailors, who was able to match engineering brilliance with organizational drive? Let us draw the curtain on the story. You see a lamppost, and there is a connection between ironmongery, street lights, and Scottish lighthouses. The link is one Thomas Smith. Now, Thomas was a Scottish businessman, a self, the first self-trained lighthouse engineer. He was born December 1752, and he died 63 years later in 1815. He was the son of a skipper who died at sea. So his mother said, stay ashore. So he got a trade, ironmongery. He became so proficient at lamp making that he grew his own business, some supplying the street lights in Edinburgh's new town, which is this image here, I think. The oil lamps that he provided featured parabolic reflectors made from burnished copper, and it so concentrated the light and enhanced its brightness, it was four times the power of the standard oil lit lamps. Why the move into lighthouse construction? Why did Thomas want to build lighthouses? His motivation was stimulated by his horror at the appalling loss of life and the loss of mercantile assets and their cargoes. Remember his own father had drowned at sea. He believed, as did a Prince of Wales, that not only that something must be done, but something could be done and that he, was the man to do it. His experiences of resolving the many problems in providing effective street lighting led him to believe that he knew how to resolve the engineering challenges that had largely defeated the engineers of lighthouse building over the centuries. So from 1787 for over 150 years, members of the Stevenson family, his descendants, planned, designed, and constructed the 96 lighthouses that continue to protect mariners from wreck and disaster. Thomas built 10 lighthouses in 10 years, all without pay, pro bono. That's the way it was in those days. He's buried in the old Carlton Cemetery, Edinburgh, a simple headstone for a very private man. I think it's very telling that, searching high and low, I have failed to find his portrait. I do wonder what he looked like. But here is the family tree. Take a note of the dates, scan them. There are confusing duplicate names. Thomas, Thomas, David, David Allen, David Allen. But they tell the story of a family firm that worked together to build amazing structures, which we will now begin to explore. You're on watch looking out at sea. You've been crossing, let's say, the South Atlantic heading for Cape Point. And you wonder if your navigation has been right until there it is, a flickering loom, a weak brush stroke of light, the origin perhaps still below the horizon. Now it rises clear, flashing white every 12 seconds, one point on the port bar, where it should be and when it should be. Position confirmed, 
after days at sea, perhaps weeks, it's a welcome sight. It's a, <laughs> it's a life saving sight. After the comparative security of the open ocean, the bruising smudge of land evokes a fear of contact in the mariner. Safe arrival in port is sought, not a sudden death on the rocky coast. Where exactly am I? Is the navigator's constant question, particularly when for days no confirmation by or position by sex and has been possible. The lighthouse light is a welcome sight. So let's meet some of the lighthouses that illuminated my course on the Scottish coast. We start at the Red Blob at a jetty sticking out into the sea, uh, loading limestone for Odder. And we'll start off very slowly and start building up as we approach Chicken Rock off the edge of the Isle of Man, head up towards the Mull of Galloway, Mull of Kintyre, Dubatach, Skerivor, Ardnamurken, Nice Point, Eiling Glass, just there, and now Cape Wrath, Dunnet Head, Torness, Duncansbury Head, and out across the North Sea to Odder. My ship was the Ferrin, one of Stevie Clark's little coasters. The second mate on these two mate ships, my job was to lay down the courses on paper charts, of course, using a pencil. And here's my passage planning book, which I've kept all these years. And you'll recognize some of those names. And I pick up the light to start off at Great Orm's Head and then soon past Chicken Rock, uh, Mew Island, or say, Wadden Merkin, Nice Point, Hiding Glass, Cape Wrath, etc all the way to order. So here we are starting our journey. Here we are at Landolis Jetty. The loadmaster calls halt to operations. The limestone dust, dust blows off the belt, empty belt, fully loaded, top of the tide, time to go. Let go fore and aft, the captain orders, full astern we go, come off rapidly, scraping the gravelly bottom as we swing round and head north, leaving Great Orm's head to port. Now. To be clear, I'm going to be talking about the lighthouses or towers in the order that in which I passed them, not in the order in which they were built. That's quite important. And I will go into detail with just a few of them, 10, but some in more detail than others. And I think their stories, which are of course unique unto themselves, illustrate many of the issues that are common to all. So here we have my first tower of interest to me on my route, Du Hatach. 28 years after his brother Alan had built the famous Skerivor, more later, Thomas Jr., son of Robert and his brother David, decided in 1862 to tackle this egg-shaped mass of black trap, rising 30 feet above the high water mark, as Thomas's son Robert Louis put it in his recollections. The scary, the rock, is called Duhatach, which I nicknamed Double Heart Attack <laughs> because I thought it was a very worrisome rock for the mariner. This rock get extraordinary weather with waves of 92 feet or more. The light needed to be 145 foot tall. The winter storms of 1865 to 1866, 100 years before I went to sea, heralded death for the sailors of at least 24 wrecks which are sh shattered on the local rocks. I'm sure you agree that loss of life is often a driver for change, sadly, an impetus to take action. And so it was. On the following year, workmen from Aberdeen landed on the rock and began construction. To speed up the work, it was necessary to keep the people who were building it on the rock overnight. So a temporary steel structure to house the constructors similar to that on Bell Rock and at Scarivore was built in 1869. It was to be a lifesaver. Continued awful weather caused severe delays in construction. So one day gambling on the present good conditions continuing, continuing the foreman, one Alan Brebner, decided to stay overnight. Big mistake. The tail end of an Atlantic hurricane howled its rage over their heads for six days. Their lives were threatened as the sea swept in through a trapdoor, swept out again, taking all the remaining food supplies. 
Imagine trying to sleep in the howl of that wind with solid walls of water, of green water, crashing down on the steel hull of the housing. The noise, the fear. It was a fearful time for them all, both for those in the barracks and for David Stevenson safely ashore, but very worried for his men. Constructed 60 feet above high water, the barracks were still not high enough. Taken around on a lighthouse inspection tour by his father, Robert Louis realized that he wasn't cut out for the life of a lighthouse engineer. His heart wasn't in it. He longed to express himself in writing, not engineering. As he said of it, an ugly reef is this of the Du Hatach. No other life was there but of seabirds and of the sea itself. It here ran like a mill race and growled around the outer reef forever and ever. And again in the calmest weather, roared and spouted on the rock itself. Duhatak was a great source of inspiration for his story of shipwreck and survival. Kidnapped. Well, I, some of you are going to say probably recognize that was not Duhatak. That last image was, of course, the Bell Rock, but it was a very nice image of storm attacked lighthouse. And so I thought I'd put it in because it made my point. Here we have architect and architect Alan Dunlop taken a sea level viewpoint in artworks that he has produced, beauty of form withstanding the wrath of the storm. Lighthouses, he said in a BBC radio interview, are a supreme example of form following function. Seeking new challenges during lockdown, he created a collection of 21 drawings of the Stevenson lighthouses. I think he captures the sea life and modern lighthouse support systems rather well. And these lighthouse, these helicopters now needed now that there's only no men on board the lighthouses. And with his permission, I am using selection to illustrate this lecture. Now I'm going to pick up my, my laser pointer and show Duhatak, Skedivor, and now I'm going to take you up to Ardemirkan through this, through this channel. Here we go. No, we're not going to Ardemirkan yet. We're going across to Skedivor, 23 miles away to starboard as I passed it. The lighthouse marks a very extensive and treacherous reef of rocks lying off the Hebrides about 11 miles to the southwest of Tyree. It was built 1844 by Alan Stevenson on this rocky outcrop and it's 156 feet tall, making it the tallest lighthouse in the UK. Robert Louis called it the noblest of all. And this tower I think is an ex outstanding example of lighthouse engineering. Scary vault, big rock, was built of granite quarried on the island of Mull between 1838-44. Alan and his men worked a 17-hour day, hard work. Four in the morning till eight at night, two and a half hours, two, one hour, sorry, try again, two half hour breaks. It's not much, two half hour breaks. No doubt the tidal variations made daily variations in their work patterns. Landing on the rock was often impossible. The uncompleted barrack, like at Duhatach, stood for two months before it was totally destroyed during a severe gale. Cranes, tools, materials often swept out into the sea, but Alan carried on in spite of setbacks. Massive blocks of stone, up to two or three tons, were dispatched by tender from Mull to Tyree, where a further workforce dressed and shaped the stones so when they were landed on the rock, each would fit perfectly onto and into the adjoining sets. So this is a 1980s view showing the size of the rock at what appears to be low tide. Low tide. Thank you, Bob McIntosh. It's really quite a substantial and still there, of course. I love this interior view. Thank you again, Bob, for because it shows how the lighthouse Keepers lived aboard Scarivore. Does it remind you, as it does me, of as your small cabin at sea? Interesting thought. Now we zoom out again 
and continue our construction. In 1840, work started on the tower, 85 blocks a day, 255 tonnes, all to be carried on small sail-driven boats. By the end of the season, the tower was just eight feet high. It was very slow going. Two years later, 1842, the last stone on top was laid. They'd gone on with it. The masonry of the tower was now 138 feet high and the weight was 4,300 tonnes. Amazing. 1st of February, 1844, Skerivor beamed out its first light and it's still going. And I read in the latest NLB journal that updates, including replacing the battery array, which was a very difficult task, dramatically improves the resilience and reliability of this magnificent light. I want to go on a very brief detour because I want you to compare that light with this light. I passed this light in 1966, but being a lowly cadet, I didn't know it. My ship was the Pigu of Paddy Henderson. We are now sailing past the Pigu coast. There's the blob you can see on our way to Rangoon. A quote here from Lighthouse Construction by Thomas Stevenson in 1880 is illuminating. He says, there are several other lighthouses in situations more or less exposed such as this, that, uh, such as this one on the Algueda Reef, which is a replica of Skerivor and carried out successfully by Captain Fraser. And Captain Fraser had come to Scotland in 1857 and given great assistance by Thomas. So of course he adapted the design and produced it here. And a note from members of the Honourable Company, next time you're on board and going to the office, you will, I'm sure, have noticed an ornate brass container with the head of um, Prince of Wales, Edward VIII on it, I don't know why it's there, which I have been informed was the oil tank for this lighthouse. I'll consult with greater authorities to know if this is true, but I like the link between the treasures on board the Wellington, Algoida Light and Skerivor. But well, let's go back to Skerivor, the designer and builder. And we're looking at Alan here. Thanks very much to the Museum of Scottish Lighthouses for being allowed to use this picture. Alan was a complex character. He was a poet and an artist. He had a deep interest in literature. He, he knew Homer by heart and read Aristophanes in Greek. Filial duty required that he followed in his father's footsteps where he could. He gave free expression to his artistic talents. He embellished a functional lighthouse with architectural elements few would ever see other than the lighthouse keepers in their families. Egyptian figurines, flourishes, sea serpents, lion heads, claw feet. He was given medals for his designs by the kings of Holland and Prussia and a splendid diamond ring from Tsar Nicholas of Russia. We, we live in an age where the kings of concrete and glass rule. Such decorated features are regarded as superfluous. But Alan's works proclaim that man does not live by function alone. Man needs more than efficiency. This plaque commemorates the laying of the foundation stone at Skerivor by the Duke of Argyle, 1840. I won't read the Latin to you. But courtesy of Google, I can read you the translation. By the authority of the Northern Lighthouse Board of Scotland, this brilliant light was built to direct mariners clear of these infamous reefs so that they would arrive safely at their next port. Penned, I feel, by Alan the Scholar. Note the Latin motto. In salutum omnium. Translation and story further later on. Now, our de Merkel light stands on the most westerly point of the British mainland. That's a well-known fact. Approaching it by bicycle from the village of Kilhoan enables you to feel that fact through weary legs pumping up the six mile track over the switchback hills leading to this isolated headland. Pushing up the final hill, a solid granite tower broke the skyline, it was immovable. 
this guide to mariners has cast its bright beam over the sea of the Hebrides, the Hebrides, for 172 years. It's a grand view from the hard standing. Built in 1849, this haunt of fish eagles was designed and engineered by Alan, son of the founding father, Robert. We note the Egyptian style chimneys, very Alan. And we'll see them again. And we see the drawing details from Thomas Stevenson's book about all the lighthouses that were built by his family. I think it's a lovely, clear picture. And again, note this roundel placed by Alan as it's scarivall and the Latin motto in salutum omnium, translation at the end. His mark is everywhere. Now, this is my chart showing the position of Arden American Light here. You can just see the pencil drawn courses through here. When the chart was retired, I took it with me. This is the small isles. Now in force 10 storms coming up through here, we needed a little respite from the rolling. And so we would duck behind this sailor's breakfast of rum, egg and muck and carry on up here to Nice Point, and then later on to Eileen Glass. The marine life that inhabits Alan's drawings remind us that these lights, like living creatures, cause consequences, beacons of hope for the mariner, but paradoxically pillars of death for the seabirds who, like moths drawn to a candle, are extinguished in the bright beams as they dash themselves to death against the stone. Research has shown that when upgrading the characteristics of a light, reducing the beam width or the width of the beam and the power of the light dramatically reduces the carnage. If any of you listening to this talk have any influence in this area of maritime construction and care for the environment, it would be wonderful if something could be done make things better for the bird lives on our coastlines. The next bright bead on our necklace of light was Eileen Glass, Thomas Smith, 1789, one of the first four that he constructed. It is the call of the cuckoo that most vividly recalls that day to me. In fact, many cuckoos. They're Mm, deceitful two-tone invitations echoed across the head of the valley. A mellifluous sound redolent of hope, of spring, of new life. We tied our bikes to the fence and set off on foot. A cold wind blew sharp in our faces, the moorland bleak and the footpath muddy. And in the distance, the solitary pillar of red and white broke the horizon. This was the edge of Scalpe, the isle off the Isle of Harris. And this rocky coastline spells danger for the mariner, hence the light. Eileen Glass, which is Gaelic for Green Island, sits on a tiny promontory which frames this tiny cove, providing shelter for vital supply boats. And I made my way along the path with caution. I noticed, as I hope you do, the remarkably tall chimneys. Where have we seen this design before? It seems very Egyptian, doesn't it? Of course, it was Alan Stevenson at work giving these keepers homes his Egyptian style in 1845. He added these buildings after his father, Robert, had in 1824 rebuilt his father's original lighthouse, a family business. I poked my head around the edge of this shattered door matching the buildings opposite these. A saggy mattress slumped against a metal frame bed, disfigured by a rather nasty dark grey mould. Black water stains trailed across a pale pink sink. A football table blocked a doorway to an undercroft just below. Abandoned entertainment. Rusted poles stood bereft of laundry and of even laundry lines. Where had all the people gone? Battling a bracing wind coming off the little minch, I rounded a corner and came face to face with an ancient low tower, to which was affixed this rusting plaque. This stump was the remains of the lighthouse built by Thomas in 1789. The red and white striped tower was Robert's replacement. 
three years ago, the NLB launched plans to maintain this stump, now a grade A listed building, about time. These extraordinary buildings, I think, are a testament to an idea that Mariners' lives are valuable and worth saving. I later learned that in 1978, the lighthouse was automated. Nearly 200 years of manned history ended. This home to many families had become empty and desolate in 30 short years. The cuckoos had not brought back the old life here on this isolated rock. I saw this lighthouse in 2017 in the flesh, so to speak, on holiday, driving the length of the Outer Hebrides. So I brought my bicycle on the back of the car and cycled up this last lap on my mountain bike and stopped in front of, on, in front of it. it. It was huge. It was 121 feet of brick. And usually the brick was never painted. Do you mariners out there remember the purple, red and green lines of the Decker Navigator charts? We stayed in the old Decker Navigator transmitting station, the very room where the huge machinery was contained was now an airy room where our host played in jazz on a grand piano whilst we ate our dinner. 30 years before, I'd passed this very same spot on my way to Archangel via the Nord Cap. You see the little ship out there? That could have been me, rounding Cape Wrath, taken in 2006 by Bob McIntosh, Chief Projects Group and Team Leader. Cape Wrath, Robert Stevenson, 1828, is set up high on mighty cliffs, high above the swirling waters of the North Atlantic Ocean as they meet the Arctic Ocean. You can only access it from Durness, 11 miles away, a short trip across a narrow channel. I have it on my bucket list, stopped by COVID in 2020. Here we go again, another chart rounding Cape Wrath. We head towards Swooky Light via Dunnet Head, two miles off. Dunnet Head, 1821, the bland catagraphic symbol. The star gives no indication of the stunning engineering marvel, the lighthouse itself and, and how it got there. The magenta flash fails to illuminate the dangers faced by the men who constructed them, men who risked their lives in response to the cry of drowning sailors, seafarers, breadwinners who died for the lack of a light to warn them that they were sailing into destruction. What I didn't realize then, and I'm only fully appreciating now, is that I was sailing over the graves of fellow sailors. Let me tell you a story about my landside encounter here 30 years later. We arrived by car, parked up, climbed out. I noticed that this was the most northerly point of the British mainland. We wandered over the rough ground, mesmerized by this purple and orange sunset. 10.30, 22.30 on a midsummer's day. A thin wreath of smoke emerged from an open manhole cover. Metallic speech floated up from below. And suddenly a short steel mast was pushed through the hatch. Ruddy cheeks above a square jaw emerged from the dark hole, followed by a dirty green T-shirt. Hello, said the stranger. What a beautiful evening. Indeed it was. Our stranger turned out to be a member of the Royal Observer Corps with a fund of stories. One he told that sticks in my mind is that during the Cold War, a Russian submarine clearly on fire had been observed heading east past this very spot. Fire went out, but not before other ROC man stations all along the Firth had slammed down their manhole covers against the possibility of catastrophic nuclear explosion. So ferrying passes, enters the Pentland Firth, Torness Light here, David A. and Charles Stevenson, 1937, lay three miles to the north, marking the northern limit of the boiling waters of the Merry Men of May. We pass Stroma here, one mile to the south as we enter the Outer Sound, 
Then we turn down towards the exit. Our swing stroma with the tide was nine knots. Our speed was 11. Timing our entry into this area was critical. The admiral tidal tables, tide tables was an essential ally. Leaving Duncansbury Head two miles to starboard, max tidal stream 12 knots, you have to time it right, we finally exited the funnel of the fourth. Alan Duncan's drawing has captured the rugged atmosphere of this isolated spot, a vital arrival and departure point for those transiting the Firth. 30 years after I'd sailed past this light en route to order, I was on holiday and, and took a walk along the cliff tops on a day of perfect blue and calm seas. We arrived at this northeasterly point. We've done all the points, haven't we, off the British mainland. And the squat low tower is quite different, as we note, from the classic parabolic curves of rock lighthouses. Built in, in 1924 by David Allen Stevenson Sr., it sits very securely on its rocky summit, far above the fury of Arctic storms. Bob McIntosh wrote about the demise of the foghorn at the Duncan Three Light. The foghorn, he says, was demolished when the closed bridge system on ships became the norm. The NLB no longer have fog signals on their, in their unman unmanned lights. Automatic control of the on-off process resulted in complaints from neighbours and the last fog signal was discontinued in 2005. Some have been saved and revived, such as Sumbra Head and Mull of Galloway, and they sounded on special occasions. When I sailed in these challenging waters in the early 80s, every one of these lighthouses was manned by members of the Lighthouse Service in the employ of the NLB. From the late 1980s onwards, a demanning, demanding policy blinded those human eyes that kept watch like guardian angels over us mariners on the little ships, sailing past their rocky outcrops. I wonder, what do you other mariners feel about that? You and I might welcome the flashing light warning of dangers on the horizon, but these innovations were not welcomed by all. Thomas Smith had to deal with the entrenched negativity against the very idea of, rec of erecting a light high on a rock to save ships and so save lives. Some shipmasters, landowners and governments didn't believe that lights would work. They were regarded as too expensive, not needed. Some believed that such lights contradicted the law of God. Masters who ran aground were stupid and the presence of lights would not make any difference. Shipwrecks were caused by storms, not by lack of lights. But it was the wreckers who had the most against the building of lighthouses. People of the coastal communities lived lives of such abject poverty that they needed shipwrecks just to stay alive. Ships, dead and dying, were their rightful harvest of the sea. So it wasn't until 1852, with the passing of the Customs Consolidation Act, which appointed official receivers of wreck, that order emerged from the legal chaos. On another shore, when I was visiting, far away, in the Fremantle Maritime Museum, I felt the power of a silent witness calling across the centuries. It was a large wooden stamp post. It had been recovered from rocks off the Western Australian coast, 400 years old. This stem post gives mute testimony, silent witness, to those masters who approached a lee shore after storm-driven weeks at sea and lacked the life-saving knowledge provided by John Harrison's invention. Position. And I think that's the sole purpose of a lighthouse to confirm life-saving information, position. We remember Thomas Smith, who was not a fatalist, but the man of action we knew. 
he knew that something could and should be done and did it. His stepson, Robert, was raised with the same mindset. When Thomas married Robert's mother, Jean, in 1792, he acquired a very willing 20-year-old, willing and able to take on his mantle. So in 1800, Robert became a full partner in his stepfather's firm and, and succeeded him as chief engineer to the Northern Lighthouse Board. And so began the dynasty of Stevenson's as lighthouse builders, engineers. An additional comment today is that thanks to the efficacy of Instagram, I learned that from the Scottish Museum of Scottish Lighthouses that this year, is the 250th anniversary of the birth of Robert Stevenson and 211 years and 13 days since the Bell Rock first showed a light. So somehow I feel my talk is most timely. Last lap now. So let's look at what influenced the development of the shape of a lighthouse over the centuries. This is the Pharos Lighthouse of Alexandra, built in 279 BC. It's one of the greatest aesthetic and technical achievements of the ancient world. It lasted for an astonishing 1,759 years, when in 1480, the Marmaluke ruler constructed a fort on the site of the Pharos and used its stones. No other lighthouse was built as mighty as that archetype, but the principle is the same. An open fire needs a firm base and a strong raised platform open to the sky. After almost 2000 years, after this construction of this marvel of the ancient world, a coal fired beacon was established on the Isle of May in 1635. Not quite so impressive, is it? But it has a strong, built as a strong low castle to resist the stormy weather, it was very effective. This beacon is the first permanently manned one in Scotland. It was considered at the time to be one of the best in existence. It used an astonishing 400 tons of coal per year, manhandled by three men, although one at the beginning, to haul it up step by step, well, and using that pulley system. But of course it was very smoky, the fire was irregular, and initially when they had only one keeper and he went fishing, the light went out. So of course the toll payers, the ship owners, were not happy. A more efficient method of fueling the light was required and placing it where it was needed, on isolated, dangerous reefs in the path of ships. Step forward, Robert Stevenson. But how? But how did the shape of the lighthouse evolve from that square dumpy tower into the elegant curved columns we know so well today? Robert's design for the Bell Rock Lighthouse was inspired by the Eddystone Light of Plymouth. The Eddystone Rocks lie 13 miles southwest of Plymouth. This small but dangerous reef has claimed the lives of hundreds of sailors and dozens of wrecks. And so it was on this battleground against the forces of nature that the shape of a lighthouse developed over 420 years into the beautiful parabolic curves we now consider so standard that every child can draw one. But what was the genesis of that design? So. We're going to tick through a few time zones. And the first and most eccentric was built by an eccentric, Henry William Stanley. He himself had lost a ship on, the rock, on this rock. So he decided that he was the one to prevent a recurrence. He built a structure that looked elegant and impressive. But after only standing for five years and a storm, it took fire. It was blown away and took the life of its creator. The next man to get a patent charter for the Eddystone was a Captain Lovett, and his architect was John Rudyard. He took a shipbuilder's rather than a house builder's approach, and he came up with the design based on a cone, not an octagon. His wooden tower stood for 47 years. It was the first offshore 
rock lighthouse in the world. Until another force of nature, fire, burnt it down. We take on now to Smeaton's Tower. The, this is where we meet stone taking, out, taking over from wood in his revolutionary and ultimately very successful design. But he was inspired by wood of an oak tree. Local granite was used for the foundations and facings. Each block was dovetailed. I remember making dovetail in wood when I was a boy, schoolboy. How they do dovetails in stone, I cannot imagine, particularly granite. But it fitted so closely to the next and was held in place by oak pins called trenails. And to help bind each course, each layer of stones together, John invented a quick drying cement that's still in use today. So the tower was completed in, and lit in 1759 by an array of 24 candles. But how did Smeaton's design inspire Robert to create his longer lasting edifice at Bell Rock? Quick location map for you. The infamous Inchcape Rock wrecked ships year after year. Underwater most of the time, it threatened vessels bound for the port of Dundee and Leith, which I have done, with an average of six wrecks every winter. Glad it wasn't me. In the 15th century, an abbot affixed a bell to the Inchcape Rock to warn passing sailors. Its removal by a Dutch pirate proved its need and proclaimed its modern name, the Bell Rock. To build the tower high enough to carry a warning light and stable enough to house three men to watch it on a rock 11 miles from land and buried under 16 feet of water twice every 24 hours in a sea much liable to storms was not a task likely to be, under, to be lightly undertaken. So wrote R. W. Munro in his detailed story of Scottish lighthouses. Very inspirational. Did this put off Robert when he assessed the same problems? No, he was convinced that he was the man with the plan and the ability and the vision to get the job done. So let's open the curtain on his bell rock, which has become the inspiration of so many lights since. He'd been sent south, Robert had been sent south to be tutored by John Smeaton. He based his bell rock design on Smeaton's, but improved upon the tree trunk idea by using the strength of a parabolic curve. If you compare with Smeaton's design, one can see the difference. The story of the building of the Bell Rock is as much a story of a struggle between three competing authorities as as much of a story of overcoming the resistance of rock and of the shaping of those curves. So the Northern Lighthouse Board gave the job of chief engineer for the building of the lighthouse, not to the man who'd campaigned ceaselessly over many years to bring about its construction, but they chose a more established engineer, John Rennie, to be chief engineer. Robert was appointed his assistant. I'm indebted to Professor Roland Paxton for his scholarly and detailed article in the NLB Journal for Winter 21 for his piece, very timely on John Rennie and the Bell Rock Lighthouse. He corrects the impression given by some historians that John did less work on this light than Robert. And he has caused a plaque to be placed at the Bell Rock Signal Tower Museum, stating that John Rennie was the chief engineer and Robert the resident engineer. I recommend this very helpful article, but I reiterate my purpose here is to paint a picture with a lighter brush. A story to finish on. The Bell Rock Light was nearly not built at all. Disaster threatened to drown them all during the building. During the early months when busy at their work, no one noticed that the supply boat, Smeaton, named after Robert's hero, and a work boat had drifted away from the mooring due to a strong wind. This was their lifeboat. Dozens of men relied on it to get them off the rock at high water every day, twice a day. Fear froze Robert's tongue. He couldn't utter a cry of warning. He could only watch 
aghast. They were stranded, alone on the rock, death was certain. But by pure chance, the pilot boat sailed up at that moment with the mail and rescued them all. But the fact remains that Robert was not to be robbed of what he saw as his route to fame through a constant bombardment by correspondence, he wore down Rennie's resistance to being in control and took control himself, stone by stone. The verdict of history is always given in favor of those who write it. I think Churchill said that. Robert's account of the Bell Light, Bell Rock Lighter, was published in 1824, three years after the death of John Rennie. And that ensured that he, that he took the credit for the design and the construction of this amazing achievement. Called by some a wonder of the modern world, it established his reputation and his career. Robert built 19 lighthouses in his lifetime. Bell Rock was his first. Lit on the 1st of February, 1811. 211 years later, it's still there still operating. To conclude my lecture, in 1881, Thomas, son of Robert, father of Robert Louis, published his seminal work, Lighthouse Construction and Illumination. He wrote, among the many works of man which prove the truth of the saying that knowledge is power, we must not omit those solitary towers, often half buried in the surge, that convert hidden dangers into sources of safety, so that the sailor now steers for those very rocks which he formerly dreaded and took so much care to avoid. Olim periculum nunc sahis would be a fitting inscription for all such beacons of the night, he concluded. What does this mean? It translates as once perilous, now safe. It is a fitting epitaph to all who have labored to make the sea safe for the seafarer, especially the early engineers of the Northern Lighthouse Board. I have just popped up a second motto, and that second motto is important. In salutum omnium is also the motto of the Northern Lighthouse Board since at least 1848. It is variously transcribed as for the safety of all. Although in some context, I think it's better translated as for the salvation of all, because salvation speaks of a much more proactive and dynamic action, which more vividly expresses that essential life-saving work of those pioneer lighthouse engineers and their towering monuments, the Stevenson Lighthouses which I, as a master mariner, have always deeply appreciated during my two decades of life at sea. And that concludes my talk. Are there any and questions? What a brilliant talk it was as well, Simon. If I might say so, delivered with an extraordinary degree of poetry as well, which carried <laughs> us along as did the same way for 15 days when we were at sea. Uh, it, it was wonderful. In those days. In those days. Long ago. I've got to, uh, uh, we, we have a, a small handful of, of questions before we go to Jenny for those. Right. I just want to thank you for an extraordinarily beautiful uh, lecture. That's the word that comes to mind. Um, a very resonant lecture because obviously I was at sea as well. Mm. And it is, a sad passing if the lights are turned off. It I cannot imagine. It I, would be terrible. I, I um, cannot imagine a coastline without lights. To be at sea and a four hour watch and to know that you're seeing that light probably for the duration of your watch from different angles was company. Yeah. It was like the angel of the waves. Yeah. Particularly um, on that coast. When I was going the Scottish coast, you relied on those lights, particularly on a storm. You didn't Absolutely. always trust your radar because they were quite primitive. Absolutely right. I must say that I did stay up all night once uh, approaching Duncansbury Head yeah. in a minesweeper, going up the East Coast, right. because we were entering the Pentland Firth at Springs. Uh -huh. 
and a good nine, 10 knot push against you uh, in a ship that is capable of making about 17 or 18 knots yes, is uh, something you've got to plan. So I didn't have much sleep that first time I went into the Pentland Firth. Yeah. But uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic testimony uh, to a family, which as you know, Simon, there is some sort of uh, family connection for me. Yeah. Marriage. Lucky uh, you, wonderful. With, uh, Robert Lewis is uh, Thomas's wife was Margaret Balfour. And my okay. second name is Balfour. It's an Edinburgh derivation. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, it, the the two things that really came to mind out of your talk. Uh, one is, and I've never been aware of this, the the, the bird risk. Yes, I think I've never done a bit of research. Never aware of that at all, and that's the most interesting one. And I think with modern technology, and hopefully with us really sort of approach to some sort of approaching some sort of tipping point as far mm. as conservation is concerned and environmental matters. I hope that's something that people will take up and and and, and look at. Yeah. But lights there must be. Uh, it's not only ships with sophisticated navigation these days. It is even the, the lone yachtsman or whatever. Absolutely. And he needs a light. Really. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. you're the one with the poetry, not me. So yeah. thank you so much, Simon. That was really a very memorable talk. And uh, and I hope as we talk about your book later on. It's a very exciting, sub very exciting subject for me. And I have so many personal memories of lights sailed past. Absolutely. How fantastic. Jenny, over to you, if I may. Thank you very much indeed. And Simon, I, I thought there was a lot of poetry in there too. And I really enjoyed that. Thank you very much. Um, we've got a question from Stephen Taylor, which Mike Bullock has answered, but I'd like your comments on it too, Mike. Simon. But Mike, is, Mike is a much greater expert than I. <laughs> <laughs> much okay. greater. Here we, here we go. Uh, Stephen says, what do you see as the future for these dramatic lights? Will the NLB cancel the lights so very apt on your recent comment yeah yeah, yeah. what was so, what was mike's answer mike's answer is in answer to stevens ta uh, taylor's question llb keeps its aids to navigation under constant review and along with trinity house and irish lights a formal five-year review is conducted and peer reviewed as a result this process uh, in the past lights have been decommissioned as no longer required. However, the process has also resulted in new lights having to be built to meet the emerging needs of mariners. NLB's yeah. latest light celebrates its first birthday next month. A new splat, I love that word, solar powered aluminium tower at the uh, Corran Narrows yeah. on Lock Line or Lock Linney. Linny, thank you, to support uh, cruise vessels visiting Port William. Uh, there are no plans to decommission any of the magnificent lights Simon has talked about this evening, or indeed any of NLB's lights. Well, that's nice to know. And uh, as a mariner, I'd love to know they're still there. And, um, and we need to look at our charts with greater knowledge. Um, I'll consult the pilot book more regularly, perhaps, for their wonderful sketches. Okay, another a, a question from Robert Hendricks. Never really said what gives the lighthouse such strength. The parabolic shape does not explain why it is strong. How did Stevenson determine the parabolic as the best? That is definitely beyond my knowledge. I, I recommend uh, Professor Paxton, but um, it's in his book, which you can get online uh, through the Gutenberg project, all these books are there and all the theory of how he came across it were all there step by step. But it was the interlocking dovetail joints and the pegging with oak nails to nails that was key. Without the interlockingness of each stone um, and producing this parabolic curve, they, they, they fell down. That, that's what, that was the problem. But the, the science behind the parabolic curve is beyond my particular um, engineering knowledge, sorry. Thank you very much. Simon, uh, sorry, um, Mike has uh, sent in another comment. Um, Simon highlighted the property at Ailing Glass was in poor shape with mouldy furniture. The accommodation at this site and the original tower are no longer the property of the Northern Lighthouse Board. 
the operational red and white tower and small adjoining operational building are still in NLB's care and in fine condition. <laughs> yes, I noticed the difference. It was the contrast between the two and the sad abandonment of these magnificent buildings. And I wondered why. And um, I know the locals are trying to uh, turn it into a museum, but they're not getting the funding and it's all been very complicated to get the funding. But it, it, it spoke of the abandonment of the, of the manned lighthouse. I thought it was poetic and uh, significant. Uh, yes, they're not the NLB's property, but it'd be nice if they perhaps helped others look after what is a treasure. Absolutely. Andy Owler, I believe that the light assembly was floated on a pool of mercury to eliminate friction. Is this still the practice or there, is there a better method now? Well, my knowledge was uh, enhanced by Channel 5's programme on the Bell Light. Uh, they used to have grinding gears, which was wearing out all the machinery. And then somebody came up with the idea of this contained bath of, um, of mercury, which is absolutely amazing. And I know the, the, the lighthouse at the bottom, uh, St. Catherine's Light off um, the Isle of Wight had the same system. But of course, lighthouse movement now, I'm sure, and Mike better tell me, are very light LED structures, not these massive Frenzel lenses of several tons. And therefore, the, the bearing load required would need quite different architecture. And um, that's another bit of theory from the experts needed. Thank you, Simon. And now I'm into um, some thank yous um, from Jeffrey Renshaw. Thank you for a brilliant presentation, very evocative of watch keeping in that part of the world and the reassurance of the flashing lights. That's nice, thank you. Um, Tanya Dawson, Thank you very much for this presentation. Well done. Very informative and with poetry. I <laughs> <Glad laughs> you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for pointing to resources for individual further study if desired. I can send, if people send uh, emails into the trust, I can email my uh, bibliography, which I've got, and I'm quite happy to share that with you. Thank you. A couple more questions just in. It seems that as we invent things, so wildlife suffers. Birds in lighthouse beams and wind turbine blades and marine life around high voltage feeds from off offshore wind farms. That's a comment, not a question. Well, yes, it's, and, but it's one that we're aware of. And I think in the design and planning, we can do something about to mitigate. I hope so for all concerned, yes. Yeah. Andy Aula, again, you suggested in an earlier part of your excellent lecture that the lighthouse keepers had their family with them. Is this correct? Andy, yeah. ex-marine engineer, them downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, downstairs. You kept us going, literally. Oh, yes, um, you, you go around a lighthouse, and I've been around several of them. They had walled gardens, even in the north, and they grew their vegetables. They kept cows, pigs. They had their families together. Um, a very important uh, community, sometimes um, quite close to the local village, but isolated at the end of a, a spur of a headland. And if you were out on the rock, the, uh, quite often the family would be close by, but couldn't actually get to them. They'd be, say, yeah. 11 miles as far as Bell Rocks and the and same at Edderstone. It was a lonely life. And I don't know how long you did, but several months. And that's why I had three stop themselves going mad or stop themselves murdering each other. <laughs> Did you know? Um, another thank you from Mort Stoll. Thank you for that wonderful talk. So hope, hope you appreciate all these thank you signs. Oh, I do, I do, yes. <laughs> and from James Buchan, he says there's an excellent museum at Fraserburgh. Right. Um, so I think where on earth Fraserburgh is, it's near the top. Is that, you mean Kincaid Light? I can't tell you. <laughs> well, uh, well Kincaid Light, of course, houses the Museum of Scottish Lighthouses. And I was going to go up there. And there's also one at 84. Oh, dear. I don't know. I've forgotten the address. In Edinburgh, of course, with the NLB. Uh, Kincaid Light, I think, is the answer, Simon. James Where? Buchan just James Buchan's come up and said Kincaid Light. I think yes. that's. Yes. Fraserburgh. Yeah. 
Yes, yep. they're very close. You, That's where you got to go. It's got to go. It's a pilgrimage. You've got to go. Thank you. Um, James Buchan also has given us a website address, um, lighthousemuseum.org.uk, for anyone wishing to study some more. Lighthouse Museum. OK, we have to send, circulate it to everybody. Yes, we do. Um, and Mike Bullock has said, we do help our neighbours where we can. There are great examples at Sumbra Head, Mull of Galloway, at Arden, excuse me, Ardner Merkin. Ah, well done, yeah. <laughs> North Ronald Say, where trust care for non-operational buildings very well. Yeah. All our visitor attractions. NLB yeah. allows the trust to take visitors up the tower. All oh, right, I shall go. Uh, <laughs> again. And... Um, Robert Hendricks says, any consideration that your National Trust could take over a few of the more spectacularly of the lighthouses? That's a nice idea. Not for me to suggest, but maybe Mike and others could get together. OK, um, Don Blake. Simon, I'm sure you know of Bella Bathurst's epic story of Robert Indeed. John Stevenson's ancestors and the building of the Scottish coastal lighthouses. Excellent talk. There is a, I'm trying to hold the book up, but my screen is not allowing me to show it. No. Is that the one called L The Lighthouse Stevenson's, yeah. Simon? It is. It, yep. Funnily enough, my screen only allows me to show my face, but it is. Bella's book is lovely, and she appears in the TV programme as well. Uh, she, Simon researched Gass. That. she researched that from a standing start. I think she knew nothing about lighthouses before she wrote that book and researched it. Yep. It was a brilliant, uh, a brilliant treatise. Inspirational. Yeah. OK, Simon Gaskin. Simon, thank you for a delightful presentation. I appreciated the approach to the subject from the perspective of a passage through the Western Isles rather than chronological order. Oh, good. <laughs> so I didn't confuse people too much. <laughs> what came first kind of thing. Um, and a couple more thank yous. Um, Helen Nixon, another thank you for a very interesting presentation. And Roger Francis, Seymour. Oh. Thank you, Simon. That was illuminating. As a master of several of the ships, including the ferrying, it yes. brought back many happy memories. Yes. Um, Roger and I were shipmates. He was my captain when I was a second mate. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, that's all the questions for now. So I'm going to hand back to Alistair now. No, I'm not. I'm going to do a I'm going to do a plug. Oh, yes, all right. For Simon's book, Gangway, A Life at Sea. Um, so if you uh, want to um, learn more about Simon's career and, and some of the uh, seafaring stories that he has to tell, please uh, visit the Wellington Trust online shop to order Simon's book. And of course, to see the other merchandise that we have on of offer. Course. So Simon, we'll look forward to um, selling lots of your books on your behalf. Excellent. <laughs> Look forward to that. Flying off the shelves. Thank you. Um, next slide. Thank you. I wanted to tell you about our next lecture on Monday, the 14th of March at half past six, as usual. Um, this is Su Susie Cox, um, senior curator at PO Heritage Collection, who's been absolutely instrumental in um, allowing us to use PO um, photographs and illustrations in many exhibitions, including the one that's coming up this summer on, on uh, South Asian seafarers. Um, we open on April the 17th, Easter Sunday. So uh, look forward to seeing you then. We're only open Sundays and Mondays, unfortunately, but uh, please check the website where you can make a booking. Uh, Susie's presentation is p and the pride and privilege of preserving a great past. And I know it's going to be fascinating. I, I, I will be on holiday, but I think I'm going to be watching. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, a final plug from me. Um, thank you to everyone who's donated already. Your donations are so important to us to run the trust uh, and to run um, the, the, the um, program of preservation of HQS Wellington and also for our educational um, uh, programs, which are building by the day. So please support us if, if you can with the address on the screen or just straight to our website and you'll be able to see a large donate button. Now I think it's back to you, Alistair. 
it is indeed. Uh, it's been a most uh, wonderful uh, evening so far. Thoroughly enjoyable, very nostalgic. Uh, once again, Simon, thank you so much for your part in it. Well, and may I, I also you? thank all those who have come to this lecture tonight uh, for coming in and also to echo what Jenny has just said in terms of your generosity over these lectures, in terms of your degree of, uh, of support. It has been most heartening and we're so grateful. Now, this ends the formal part of the evening. For those who would like to stay on, as I said at the top of the lecture, just hang around for a bit and uh, Matt will, Matt Edgar will pull you back into the follow-up. So uh, with many thanks for that and hoping to see you in future lectures, that ends the formal part of the evening. Good night. Ah, you're still there, Simon. Yeah, I, don't, I think I'm meant to be, aren't I? <laughs> yeah, well, it is entirely up to you. <laughs> it's, it's great. I just love that photo behind you. Oh, yeah, great, great. Yes, yeah, so I stood there, took that, midnight, no, 10.30 at night. I remember one of my um, memories was being out in the Minches. Uh, we were doing fishery protection out in the Minches mm -hmm. and watching a pair of, um, of stern trawlers, paired trawlers, uh, just going along at about one and a half knots on this absolutely glassy sea uh, with the sort of light that's shown in the picture behind you. Yes. Uh, and this was about one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. Uh, it was just, you know, it never got dark. It was that time of year. And, no wind, uh, seeing no wind blowing. It's lovely. It's just no wind blowing, just the reflection of these pair of trawlers, these yeah. pair of trawlers uh, going through the water. It was wonderful. We're very when, privileged as mariners, some of the things we get to see. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah very much so. My goodness, this is fantastic. Good to see everybody. Bruce Lecren, are you on the other side of the uh, the Atlantic or are you over here by chance? I'm about as far as salt water, uh, as far away from salt water as you can get here in uh, the middle of Alberta. I oh thought goodness. perhaps you might be. You looked, you looked, I've got to say, you looked like one of our American friends and this is fantastic to have you again today, tonight. Well, Thank you. It's, it's nice to be here. Uh, we have snow every day, all week uh, long. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> well, that's fantastic, Bruce. Long, long may we see you uh, on these lectures. That's Thank great. You. And Holly, I, you're I, there. Like Holly, you're back. Hi, you're looking I'm good. Here. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Yeah, oh, my goodness. Did you get your snowstorm? Oh, yeah, I forgot to tell my you wife. You got it. <laughs> uh, I would like to You've got your snowstorm, eh? Uh, Simon, I would like to thank you for the presentation. I love lighthouses. Okay. I live, I live in Kenosha, Wisconsin, USA. That's yeah. in southeast Wisconsin, facing Lake Michigan. So okay. my apartment windows face Lake Michigan. I look at the water and the boats, not today. And I want to tell you also, I have never been to Scotland, but I do embrace Durness and yes. the Isle of Lewis, the north, the very far northwest point, which I have now learned before your presentation. That is the butt of Lewis. So that's right. Take, think... take the take the ferry to Ullapool yes. and get to Stornoway, and we have only yet to be gone. No. <laughs> Yeah, well, I've, I've done that. I've done that. That's now, how I got there. I took the I ferry. Want to tell you, I want to tell you, the lighthouses that I know in the States, a lot of them have been have been automated. I, under, I respect, I understand that. Decommission, how can you decommission? It's like, you, you, well, we'll get rid of the traffic light at Trafalgar Square because we don't need it. How could you decommission a lighthouse? They need light. Yeah, well, they, they keep Even the light. In the States, they, take the, they need to see. They take the they take the men off the light. It's all automatic. I I'd like I'd like to say that uh, I'd like to I, say I'd like to say that around the uh, Great Lake, there around all the Great Lakes uh, on the Canadian side, the lights have been unmanned. Uh, oh. They've been replaced with automated beacons. But a great many of the uh, of the lights and their buildings, the keepers' homes, are now private residences. They were sold by Parks Canada 
uh, decades ago, and a lot of yes. them are now private residences. So. Uh, we have a we have a lighthouse in Evanston, Illinois, which is northeastern Illinois, facing Lake Michigan. And you can go on a tour for the light at the lighthouse, which I've done. I'm 67 now. I did it when I was in my 20s. And the uh, lighthouses, the lighthouse keepers home is now a museum. So like you say, they're doing the same thing in uh, Canada, which I also like Canada. Uh, and it's yeah. good that they do that. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting indeed. <laughs> When my children were very young, there was a children's book we bought them called The Lighthouse Keeper's Lunch. And it was a delightful story. I wonder if it must be somewhere in the family. Yes, yes, I know it well. I read it to my children. Well, there we are. I think and she I, rode across to take the lunch in. Wasn't that right? Yeah. yeah. And um, I, I used it to teach my children design technology and how, because I was a teacher for 20 years. Yeah. And one of the things I got them to do was to build a lighthouse and then build a, the house for the lunch. And they had to design a pulley system to get the lunch back to the lighthouse keeper on his, on his isolated It was town. absolutely lovely. But uh, there's so something you one. made, which was almost a comment you made, Simon, it was almost lost. And it is absolutely a fact that that's why there are three lighthouse keepers at yes. one time, yes. to stop one of them killing the other one. Yes. <laughs> which would yes. be disastrous for keeping the light going. Yes. But it doesn't always work. I've got to say, because uh, in 1960, we had a, a murder at Little Ross, where we had no. uh, one keeper kill the other. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, oh, uh, really? Yeah, yeah, really. Yeah. My God. Yeah. So um, it wasn't a great oh. crime of the century, mind you, because there, were, there weren't <laughs> many suspects in the whole game. But there you go. <laughs> Was it was a choice what? between the monastic orders and uh, being a lighthouse keeper in those days, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Very John, careful, it's yeah. good to see you back. It is indeed. Thank you. <laughs> and actually seeing charts and um, seeing you thinking of charts and thinking of lighthouses, one of the things I really enjoyed was working out uh, exactly what the signature of the light is from the abbreviation that's on the nautical chart. <laughs> so you have GPFL, this is done it head. Group flash. You have GPFL brackets four, close brackets three, and siren under it. That was only part of it because it was obscured, but that means it's group flashing four, 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 um, um, flashes. four flashes. Four flashes, yeah. And yep. then I think, was that a pause of three seconds? I don't know what it was, it just said three afterwards, or whether there was three seconds between each pause. But it was that sort of detail that was put onto a chart for those who haven't been to see. Uh, which uh, is actually incredibly important to understand what you're looking at, particularly yeah. where you don't know where you are, which was very often yeah. the case when yeah. Decker Navigator was not uh, working. Yeah. And um, um, there we are. Anyway, that's boring. <laughs> that's me. Gosh, Stephen, good evening. You're, you're, you're muted, Stephen. You're on, you're on mute, Stephen. There we are. I'm muted, mute. yes. Good evening, Elsa. Welcome. How are you recovered? Oh, nice to be here. Well, that's yes. good. You're looking well enough. Hanging in. <laughs> that's the most important thing, Stephen. It really is. Oh, it have, is. You got, yes. uh, have you got recollections of Lighthouse-related uh, episodes when you were at sea, Stephen? Oh, yes, indeed. Um, Arden, uh, not Arden Merkin, uh, Loch Maddy. Loch Maddy, I remember Loch Maddy. No, no Colin, there, there is a lighthouse right on the edge of, uh, of Loch Maddy, yeah. which I was last there in a force 12 of 88 knots of wind. Wow. Which Good was, heavens um, above. In, in a fissure protection minesweeper. Oh, it really? Bounce, bouncing up and down. Sounds very dangerous. Bouncing up and down, yes. It was a bit of a disaster. But um, Loch Maddy, as I recall, I must just... say, it is those lights, though, that one got when you were steaming up and down the minches it yeah. was those lights that were one's uh, safety security it just kept you going reassurance Without, Stephen. it's hard to think how a mariner can survive at sea in uh, in a safe environment without that encouragement that those lights give exactly and um, um, it would be a tragic day when modern technology done. just won't won't survive it won't, won't won't cure it no no captain quail 
Hello. Captain, I just Hello. behind you is Dunnett Head Lighthouse, if I'm uh, correct. Yes. Yeah, the, the scene behind you. I just thought people would be interested to know uh, that the two of the cottages at Dunnett's Head, Keeper's Cottages, are now available for rent. Uh, I happen to look oh, that up because oh, at, really? one point, at one point we were interested in, in actually purchasing a place there. Oh, right. Uh, and, but find that people have t taken that over now and they're available online. Wow. Yeah. It's a shame. Good heavens. I'm, I'm going to have to have a break. Thank you. Thank you. Say goodbye. Good to see you. Thanks for coming Thank on, you. Bruce. Thank you. Can I, Thanks, Bruce. Can I relate a story? Yes, do, John. During the Second World War, Francine, my wife, is French-Canadian, so it's slightly relevant to her, too. The, I think it was the uh, Canadian aircraft carrier Bonaventure, which transited the Pentland Firth, um, heading west during a filthy gale. And uh, the wind was so strong that it peeled back the flight deck. And she barely made it to harbour, uh, was really taking in a lot of water. And I can certainly remember an HMS Dido, who could barely make any sensible way the uh, hmm. the stream was so strong around the top there. It's quite a piece of water. I had to deliver. C can uh, I inspection. can I just jump in there, please? Could did you say HMS Dido? Yes. Well, Leander. What what year is that? Because my father was on a Dido in the war. Oh right, that's the previous one. I was uh where were we? sixty six to oh right no, sixty eight. 20 years before. <laughs> yeah, I'm not that old, but uh, <laughs> no, <getting older. laughs> I just thought the ship might be. <laughs> no, sorry, carry Proud on. Man. Could I come in a, a moment and no, say thank you uh, uh, to, uh, for the invitation and the possibility to join today? I, I think I got it as a liveryman, but uh, I happen to be the treasurer of a charity called the Association of Lighthouse Keepers. And if any of you are interested uh, in uh, Lighthouses sufficiently to look us up on our website. Uh, you might be interested in, in joining, and they produce a a very good quarterly journal called The Lamp about lighthouses, mostly in in uh, Europe, but also all over the world too. Uh, I have a great uh, enthusiasm for Scottish lighthouses in particular, and was on a splendid voyage. We hired a boat with uh, uh, ten other enthusiasts. Uh, to sail out of Oban uh, and round uh, lots of the lighthouses which were mentioned today in, in, in and around the Hebrides. And we're also lucky enough to get out to Kilda. Uh, there isn't a lighthouse on Kilda, but it was uh, the weather was uh, kind enough to let us get there, and it's a great place to visit too. Uh, the museum at uh, Kinnaird Head is, is in a spot of bother because they lost the roof of part of their building in the storms towards the end of last year mm -hmm. and uh, going to take a while, I'm afraid, to, to recover from that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, thank you all for the uh, opportunity to join. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed for that uh, that bit of information, which I've scribbled down to make sure. I must say hello that. to my old shipmate, Roger. Oh, hello. How are you? Where is he? Well, he's down there hiding. <laughs> hello, Roger. <laughs> Good to see you on, on the, tonight, and it was a very good chat. I, and uh, the Pendulum Firth, I, I had quite a bit of deals with dealings with that when I was. We did, uh, we did. So did you take the? You took the ferrying from Londillas to Water, didn't you? I did. Yes, a, a few times. Yes, well, there you go. So just to colour this talk, this was the captain, my, my captain at the time. Possibly I can't remember. I know I was with you when we went to Water, but um, yeah, good story. Yeah, sorry, it was. Uh, the ferrying was an incredibly interesting ship. You know, it, it, it was uh, getting a bit old when I was on it, I think. Uh, um, we had a, a situation where we, um, the mate asked the uh, bosun to uh, scale the, uh, the deck of the laundry, uh, which was above the engine room. And he scaled the deck of the laundry only to find that uh, he was seen looking into the engine room. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. I imagine all, all the washing dripping over the years have probably uh, rotted through the deck. Yeah, <laughs> replating. Um, yeah. Can I 
just interrupt George. We've got Andy, uh, Andy Arla and George Lang have both got their hands up. George, should I take you first of all, if that's possible? Uh, good evening. Good evening, Simon. Um, good evening, George. First, thing first, Simon, have you changed the cover of your book? Yes. Yeah. Right. yeah I'll have to get another one off you next uh, October or November then. The, the, lo the latest one has all the ships I sailed in. I've updated it a wee bit. And it's got a list of 37 ships and uh, all their details for those who desperately need to know what happened to them. <laughs> say, Interesting indeed. Free, free sank. Well, I'm not going to say a word, Simon. Um, Alistair, you were talking about like characteristics, and it just reminded me of an maybe apocryphal story, but I believe it's true. Um, a well-known oil company had a refinery up the edge of a, uh, up right at the end of a Norwegian fjord. And a ship that was on that run regularly um, went to that fjord, fully laden. And uh, the lights around that fjord and the one next door to it, the shapes were very similar as a lot of them are up there, had, um, were in the same place, more or less. So taking fixes off the lights would put you on a reasonable position and there was no thing. The trouble is the lights were different characteristics, but nobody checked them. Uh, so uh, the anchor arrived at the end of the fjord with no refinery um, and I think quite a lot of embarrassment because lights were all different similar positions relatively of course so you know three three bearing fixes and things came in um, but unfortunately they weren't uh, the rhythms were all different. My, uh, my first boss um, I was a, a land agent agricultural land agent years ago an improver it was so long ago it was eons ago he always said, time spent in reconnoitering is seldom wasted. Someone mm -hmm. should have read the bloody chart. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, thank you very much, George. Andy, you've, you've got your hand up. Uh, yes, just thank you. Thank you, Simon, particularly for a fascinating talk. I would like to, to put your mind to rest that those downstairs didn't take any notice of lighthouses. I, I served on a pre-war um, Lake Maracaibo <laughs> tanker we were shipping oil around from Forley to the Sandestry. I remember going down on watch at eight o'clock in the evening as, a, as my first trip, fourth engineer, seeing the Dungeness uh, lighthouse uh, abeam. Uh, we were plodding along at about eight knots in a sort of eight knot tide against us. And I was very pleased to find we were just in the same place when we came off watch four hours later. And we took a great deal of interest in that lighthouse. A fascinating talk. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Dungeness reminds me of the Royal Sovereign, because the Royal Sovereign Lighthouse was dis decommissioned, I think, wasn't it? Or the light was. It wasn't actually a lighthouse. But light I remember ship. when we were in the channel. Light ship. It was a light ship. Yeah. Yeah. She was, uh, she was kind of important. And I think it was a few years ago. She was taken off for some reason. Anyway, that's just in passing. Thomas Ruggiero. Dungeness is quite interesting, too. There are two lighthouses at Dungeness. And the new one had to be built um, because the um, nuclear power station there uh, obscured the view of the uh, the original lighthouse. That's a bit of a faux oh, pas. Really? Interesting. That's interesting. interesting. Not so far from talking about nuclear power stations, not far from Sizewell, where at the moment here in Suffolk, uh, obviously the inevitable arguments are going on about Sizewell C. Just down uh, around the corner from Orford on the coast was a lighthouse um, which stood there, red and white banded. Um, it has not been a lighthouse through many years, but because of the coast erosion, the owner I think either has or is planning to dismantle the lighthouse and to move it a, a fair distance inland as well because of the coastal erosion. I mean, it is one of the, one of the sort of sites of Suffolk in a way this uh, lighthouse down at Orford. And uh, it's very sad, but it's good that someone actually who owns it as a house um, mm. is thinking, let's do something to preserve this, which is good. I mentioned Thomas Ruggiero. It's good yes. to see you. Indeed, yes. thank you for coming back. You are obviously a model maker, aren't you? Yes, I, I am. Yeah, that's uh, HMS Liverpool behind me. Which, which HMS again? HMS Liverpool. Liverpool, good heavens. What's the story of her? Uh, she was built in 1757. Yep. Uh, was rebuilt three or four times before coming over to the colonies, and she basically she was uh, she was uh, at the mm -hmm. 
Um, she uh, evacuated the royal governor from Williamsburg, Virginia. Uh, there is a cannonball from the Liverpool that's still in a church in Charleston. I think Charleston, or Nor I'm sorry, Norfolk. Yeah. And uh, then came up the coast, was in the Delaware when, um, when uh, Philadelphia was occupied. And then after that, came up to uh, New York and sank in a storm February of 1778. Yeah. Good heavens above. Yes. So, um, so this is a model that I built uh, quite a while ago, and um, it was a lot of fun. It's completely scratch, completely scratch built, and it's it, uh, fantastic. One eighth inch to the foot, and um, I, I appreciate the, the invitation from from you. And I, I need to tell you, I, I passed on the invitation, and I'm surprised that she's not here. I passed on the invitation to the director of the National Lighthouse Museum here in the states. Oh, and. Um, yeah, I was, I'm wondering why she didn't show up, but they are trying to get to new facilities. They're, 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 in, a, they're in the original lighthouse building uh, in Staten Island in New York Harbor. And um, they're trying to get into larger facilities and they need, uh, they need uh, funds actually, obviously to do that. And I've been told that, uh, that, they, uh, that um, they have solicited Queen Anne uh, to come over because I understand that she's patron of lighthouses in, in the UK. If that's true, I don't know. You mean Princess that, Anne, don't you? Princess, Sorry, princess, princess Royal. That's right. Princess, princess Royal. Sorry, my slip. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is highly likely. If I tell you that our, our royal patron, Queen Anne. she is, um, she <laughs> is involved with something in the region. Jenny, you'll correct me on this thing. In yeah. the region, about 300 trusts and charities to her name. She is. Oh, yes. Yeah. The Princess yeah. Royal is uh, the patron for the Northern Lighthouse Board, and she's also the master of Trinity House. She has yeah. two distinct lighthouse roles. She is yes. the most incredible person. She yes. is. Yeah. She is. Yeah, I read, read a little bit of history about the Trinity House. Very, 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 uh, very. Uh, um, actually, Admiral Benbow was the was the book that I read. And uh, so, yes, yeah, so I appreciate the invite. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll hang on. I, I enjoy this. I really, really do. Uh, and thank you. And uh, Simon, that was a fantastic, uh, a fantastic discussion. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Thomas. And thanks for that reference to Admiral Bembo. That's the second time in two days I've heard about a book for Admiral Bembo because actually... I'm my late father-in-law had a book on Admiral Bembo, and the chap who was looking after all his effects said to me yesterday, I hope you don't mind, I've just borrowed that book on Admiral Bembo, so it's very strange you should mention it. <laughs> it's, it's, actually, it's, it's actually a trilogy. It's part of a trilogy. The author escapes me right now, but the trilogy, trilogy was excellent. It yeah. really was. Thank you for the reference. Indeed. That's great. Alistair, well, I noticed behind uh, Tanya's head, she's got a yeah. lighthouse. So what's that about, Tanya? Uh, th thanks for asking. Yes, I, I live in New Mexico, so I don't see too many real life uh, <laughs> Put that on the list, houses. New Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's it's inspiration to me. Uh, this action one is actually located in France, the one I'm on my closet doors <laughs> in my office. Yeah. Uh, what is it? Which one is it then? I don't remember the name of it. It starts with a C. Um, uh, but I, I'm a, I have just like published it. a book on... Um, uh, on uh, with the uh, lighthouse as one of the main characters, it's called Anderson Light, and uh, so I, I I've been writing this with uh, very little exposure to lighthouses. It's published now, but I'm writing book two, so I still need the inspiration. Yep, I get <laughs> to it answer, to answer the question. Yeah, okay. would it be Calais, <laughs> Calais, I, France, maybe? Yeah, I may be. It may very. That sounds right. Yes, well, but um, on the English uh, Channel. I'm I believe so. Yes. Oh. Is your but book going to be available over here in the UK, Tanya? I beg your pardon? Is your book going to be available over here in the UK? Yes, it's on Amazon and all those things. So, yes, it's called Anderson with an E-N, Light. Anderson right. Light. Yes, it's a it's a fiction novel. Yep. Uh, but I, I did uh, uh, I did some I didn't research uh, because I the most of the book is set in this fictional lighthouse. And I and I had done some research, so I was very pleased to hear in, in Captain Quayle's 
uh, presentation today, the uh, mention of uh, Robert Stevenson. And um, I, I, and I had forgotten the name of, of Mr. Smith. And, um, and oh, I Smith, just, yeah. Yes, I, I'd like to learn more about that. And but anyway, yes, I'm so uh, uh, happy to join you guys this time. And I hope to to join you in the future as well. It's been very inform informative. And I, I've been trying to keep track of and keep up with taking notes with all the references that you've been all that you've been, talking about you can you can hear it all again tanya including what you're saying just now oh just okay well, on the link. So you've got a reference right. uh, yeah, you, you might also might know if you want to know more about the stevensons that book the lighthouse stevensons was written what simon about 20 years ago probably wasn't oh, it bella 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 Bathurst. bella Bathurst. Yeah. i'm just yeah. looking up my copy see when it was uh, published um 1999 Yep, I wasn't far out 20 years. Uh, and no. she's still around because she was on the TV program that's just been broadcast. So um, that's fascinating. Good, it really and is. Tanya, that's a beautiful Even. New England lighthouse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just a quickie breaking in. We, yeah. we were talking about the Bembo recently, beautiful, a few minutes ago. Lighthouse. Yeah, sure. And um, it just happens my, my dog, I was looking for a name, a good naval name to call a Labrador. Yeah. And Bembo hit me. I mean, Bembo. <laughs> savaged the French many times. He loved his lads, and uh, the officers weren't all that keen on him. And he's become a bit of a hero of mine. And the Don't other take day, him anywhere near birthday, President Macron, Stephen. I was given <laughs> this badge, which is the badge of HMS Ooh. Bembo. Bembo, fantastic. <laughs> and that goes back to the um, the 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 say the the, the the three decker two two decker three decker. Yeah. Bembo. Yeah. Because there was a Bembo in the First World War, which was one of the dreadnoughts uh, and was a, a, did fight at Jutland. But it's amazing how these ships' badges um, sort of go back and relate histories. It's um, incredible how unchanging of, they are. One of, one of, it's, it's just a hussy. Um, yeah. But um, I'm trying to find a bit more about the, um, the, the Bembo family organization that would have been around in um 1790s if anybody the, has any information on it i'd love to hear it the, uh, the, i'll dig into that book thomas ruggiero probably is going to have some information on that as well but jenny's going to say something on, i'm looking i'm looking it up right now oh well um, done <laughs> Ad okay. admiral bembo the book is by sam willis yes right. thank you Jenny. Yes. there you go that's that's but, um, and he also did the fighting tem uh, fighting Temerera. 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 Yeah. Yep. You know that famous that famous painting by J. W. M. Turner. Yes. The artist of yeah. the fighting yes. Temerera being towed in to her last breakup. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's the most beautiful painting. Yeah. Yes. So, um, she was the first rater. He goes through the entire. Uh, he goes through, goes through the through both of them. And he then carries it through to the painting itself and the history behind the painting. Oh, really? Yes. Fascinating. Fascinating. Yes. Yes. Excellent, excellent book. Oh, that's beautiful. Tom, while well, we've got you with your yep. model of HMS Liverpool behind you, was she one of the those special nine Confederate frigates that were fantastically built in the States, which yeah. um, we, we mm. failed to copy in this country? No, she was she was built in 1757, and she was built in uh, Power Powell and I forget, I forget the name of the shipyard, but it was a, it was a commercial shipyard. She was the third ship of that particular class, which started with it's. If you go to a National Maritime Museum, I actually use the plans of the Maidstone. So yeah. Maidstone was number two. She was number three. What was in very interesting about it, not to get too technical, but was very, very interesting about it is uh, you could just barely see from the photograph behind me that the households are, are, are just below, just below the, uh, the, the rails at the bow. And you notice that usually they're between the two cheeks below. Well, the original ship as designed, actually you could see it on the, on the drawings was that the households and the cable handling were the deck below the gun deck. Okay, this, yep. inclu this included the pumps. Yep. 
right? Uh. And you could see that that they they haven't in in pencil the relocation of the households and they moved everything up one deck including the pumps and the reason why they did that is before they launched this particular ship on the ships that were launched before it some brain surgeon figured out that having the outlets from the pumps below the water line wasn't a good idea <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, they weren't designed to be below the waterline, but if you had any healing to the ship at all, the the the, the pump the pump fails were below the waterline. That's fantastic. I I hope you don't mind. I've stolen a photo of your fine model. Was she a second rate or a third rate? That's that's a sixth rate. A sixth rate. Sixth rate. Yes. Good heavens. And, yes, and and it's only it's only twenty eight guns. It's yep. only twenty eight guns. Uh, if you send me your email, I'll mm -hmm. uh, I can send you a few photographs. That will be really wonderful. Thank you so much. I'll take you up on that, Thomas. Okay. Very Thanks nice a lot. ship, Tom. Very nice. Thank you. Right. George, what's your lighthouse you've got there, George? Well, you, you, uh, some of you will recognise that because you'll have used it as a headmark coming into Plymouth Sound. Oh, I, I, that's Smeaton's Tower. That's yeah. Smeaton's Tower. I've, I've been so familiar with that. I thought I've just checked for. I can see it. If uh, it's winter, but if it had a light on you, I could bring the flash in through the window for you. Well, I never. I did. can see the top of it from here, and I can That's see fantastic. the Edison. That is every so day. on message. That's so on message, George. I'm, I'm impressed. Sure. <laughs> David, David Blake, good to see you. you you've got our long service and good combat <laughs> medal uh, for the month because you're definitely the longest uh, serving. <laughs> Uh, one in the wash up after the lecture every time. Great to see you again. How's Cape Town? How's the Cape? And are the lights burning brightly down there? You're on mute. Self unmute. Let me get self unmuted. I got your clue. Yeah. Yeah. Well, everybody's said about everything, Simon, about the quality of your talk, and I can't uh, do anything other than echo that. I suppose down in the, the, the Western Cape, we had some excitement a few days ago when the um, SA Agullis II came through on its way down to the South Pole to, to um, retrieve, I guess that's the word, the um, uh, Shackleton's endurance. Endurance? Gosh. I don't know how they're going to do it, but, but anyway, this, this is um, what we were learning. Hopefully, they will have something to report, and then hopefully we can... Um, they reckon she's in 2,000 metres or something, don't they? Extraordinary. <laughs> I didn't realise it was that deep. It is. <laughs> it's oh, a long way down. Oh, oh. But, then, uh, it's, uh, yeah, then it certainly is. Um, so maybe the, the, the story was a smokescreen or to sell newspapers. Yeah. I think it's, uh, I think it's a fantastic uh, endeavour. There we are. On that note, we're now at nearly quarter past 8 p.m. UK time, 2014. So I think probably, I don't know, but it's time for a Cheers, glass Cheers, everybody. Of Thank oh, you, Simon. Thank you again question. for coming. I think it's nine o'clock. May I just it's nine o'clock. I think it's great. It's good of you all to come on and hang around. It's so good. Holly, yes. you're going to say yes, something. I just want to ask Simon a question, please. Yeah, go. Simon, have you ever been up to Orkney or Shetland Islands? Like I've, been, I've been to the Orkneys. I took ferry from good. John O'Groats. Yep. Good, and, good. And, we, and, we, and, and I went to Kirkwall. Uh -huh. From, from Kirkwall this Kirkwall. And this, did you know that the cathedral there is the model for Durham Cathedral? I never knew that. No, I did not. Thank you. Same people. Thank good you. heavens. Above. Thank you. Just a, Kirkwall is a very just, good place. Just a smaller one. You've been there, have you, Holly? I have not been. I have not been to Scotland or Orkland or Shetney Islands, but I do embrace remote. You, you can tell I like remote a lot. <laughs> and so I mean, I'd be looking on a map to see where you travel and uh, the other lighthouses that you have mentioned. Hi, Jenny. Thank you, Jenny, darling. Um, uh, yeah, I, I love that. And plus the lighthouses. And I didn't know when I was doing my homework in advance of this pro, pro, uh, uh, webinar 
Robert Louis Steve, uh, Stevenson. All right, type in Stevenson. What does Robert Louis Stevenson have to do with a lighthouse? Oh, it's his family. Now That's you the know. lighthouse family. And he didn't go into the family business. But he, tried. Okay. he tried. He did a lot. He did a lot, but it didn't suit. Are there any Stevenson family members? Are there any descendants still living that? You're, oh, you're looking at one. Stevenson's and Leslie's as well. Uh-huh. Alistair uh -huh. is one. Well, uh, yes, uh, yes okay. true. I'm, I'm descended from um, Robert Louis Stevenson's mother, Margaret Balfour, yeah. as she was called. Um, There's quite a I lot just around. Love lighthouses. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I just love lighthouses. I just, I just Honestly, love in fact, my beloved cousin, Ewan Lawrence, is on this screen at the moment. Um, uh, Ewan Lawrence comes from Edinburgh as well. He's also part of the same family. That's why he's a cousin of mine. Good evening, Ewan. I hope you enjoyed that. You are a, a aficionado as well for um, Stevenson Lighthouses, I know. So um, we have a we have a great gathering here tonight. Anyway, stay well, everybody. Stay I think well, that's everybody. Probably it. Stay Drop well. off as you like, and we'll see you next month. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.